So the Lord has been showing me the difference between revival and renewal. And one of the reasons I find this important is because revival is a very Western word. The word revival is very Western and it's actually really new. If you were around the Eastern expression of the church or what we would call the Orthodox expression of the church, they would talk about renewal everywhere we would talk about revival. They would talk about renewal. There are books I've got. I've got books on uh, the theology of renewal. I've got books on the doctrine of renewal. Because if you traveled into the Orthodox world and talked about what it is that we're experiencing as a family, they would call that renewal. We call it revival. And I believe the reason why we call it, and revival is a good word. I love the word revival. We call it Carolina revival. This is city revival church. So don't get me wrong. It's revival is a good word. But revival at, at the root of the word means to bring back to life that that is without life. It's a, the word revival is a restoration of vitality. Vitality has been lost. God comes in in a moment and brings revival. The Orthodox world saw it as renewal because they weren't as conscious of the soul being saved as they were of the spirit being renewed. Anytime God starts to move in the Western church, we immediately begin to think in terms of lost people, heaven, and hell. But in the Orthodox world, they weren't primarily, when God began to move, think of, we got to get a bunch of people to repeat the prayer so they don't all go to hell. They would begin to think in terms of, there's now a measure of presence available that's going to give us the opportunity to move into a place of identification or re-identification that is going to give us the pliability to be reformed. So they didn't call it a Protestant revival, although it was a revival. They called it a Protestant reformation because what they saw was the Spirit of God coming with the the, the manifestation of renewal. That's why oil is always associated with the move of the Spirit because we have to get back to a place where we can be reformed. So one of the first things that happens in the outpouring of the Spirit is the dry, parched, cracked, inflexible parts of who you are begin to experience a softening malleable is the word that I've been using lately where Yahweh begins to restore to the wine skin what is necessary for it to be able to hold new wine so we know that the word for new is used over and over again when Jesus is talking about the old garment and the new garment and he's talking about the old wine skin and the new wine skin the word new is used over and over and, and neos is the word every time but one time. The only time the word neos is not the word is when we get the word for the wine skin. The, the, the wine's always, listen to this, the wine is always new in a quantitative sense. Okay? The patch on the garment, new in a quantitative sense. The wine skin is new in a qualitative sense, right? Right? So it's a new wine skin is not a wine skin that's never had wine in it before. The new wine skin is a wine that has gone through a process of renewal, which would have been inclusive of both oil and fire to bring the wine skin back to a place of pliability where it could hold something new. And what happens is in, in renewal, <laughs> we, if we don't shift, this is, a, this is a big, big thought. Here's why. If we don't shift our thinking in regarding revival and renewal, then what we'll do is we'll only see revival as a means whereby people who are dead come back to life. And it needs to be a means where people are dead come back to life. How, what happens then if we don't shift into renewal out of revival and we only believe the reason God comes is to deal with dead people, then you and I miss what he's trying to do in renewal, which is bring us into a place of reformation where he can bring a new wine that it would not even be safe for us to experience had we not gone through a process of renewal. So as he begins to bring us deep, more deeply into renewal, if we don't, let me say it like this, if we don't make that shift, we'll actually subconsciously see the falling away as a necessity. So we'll have a revival and then we'll have a falling away and then we'll have a revival and then we'll have a falling away, which is why there's never been a revival in the history of the world ever get handed to the next generation. 
There's never been a transgenerational revival in history. Salah. Why, why, why is that huge? Why? Because when God began to move, if we made it all about the lost, okay, and guys, I have to be, I, I, I know I need to qualify that statement because it sounds so, like I don't care about lost people. I have a track record that can prove to everybody in this room, I care at least 10 times more about lost people than any of you. Because I spent my life 300 days a year getting people born again. And I come back to the church a year later and they're not there. Because they were not introduced to an atmosphere whereby what they experienced as new then remained new. And it's, listen, it's not enough to, for what God's doing to be new. It can be newer than that. And it can be newer than that. And it can be newer than that. And reason why we lose revival is because we miss the nuances. Come on, somebody. Of him trying to make it newer than it was when it was embodied in another expression. And as revival grows and as revival matures, if we don't make that shift, as soon as lost people quit coming to repeat the prayer, we'll think revival's over. So th therefore, for revival to exist, we don't need the city to be one in a day. But if renewal is the aim, then we understand the person who went by way of revival through a restoration of vitality is now being positioned and qualified to experience a new measure of fire and oil that brings a new pliability to their internal world so they can be reformed into the ones Yahweh's designed them to be because there's newer wine than the wine that we have now. And, and typically, one flavor of wine is served in each revival. So we had the laughing revival, right? We had the revival where everybody yelled and screamed and cried out under conviction. That, that was real. That, that is a wine. The, the shaking, that is a wine. The people being born again, that is a wine. The first great, great awakening had a measure of wine. What Yahweh is looking to do is Yahweh is looking to bring a manifold expression, multicolored expression of what he is. So therefore what he's doing is one night can look one way, one night can look absolutely another way, and you don't fight against the nuance he wants to reveal on that particular evening because you recognize this is not about accomplishing one thing, this is about reforming everything and we're going through a complete restoration so that we can see an absolute reformation and out of that reforming we're going to begin to experience listen wine no one's ever experienced before wine no one's ever experienced before well what where's that in the bible well eye has not seen ear has not heard neither hath entered the heart of man you hear what I'm saying? It's wine no one's ever seen before. It's manifestations of his goodness that no one's ever seen before. It's measures of beloved identity that have been reserved for a day when the age shifted and he was ready to bring Zion to the fullness of her mountain. Yes. All right. So what, what I've, I've been in revival, word language that we would use, for six and a half years. I've been in a personal Revival. That's longer than the average shelf life of most historic revivals, which, which is an absolute indictment against leaders in revival. He gave us something so glorious that it could transform nations and we turned it into a few years where we had great services and people left exhausted why? Because we weren't thinking in terms of reform. We weren't thinking in terms of renewal. We were thinking in terms of a restoration of vitality. And once vitality has been restored, I think people subconsciously drift away so that they can come back. That's a profound thought, huh? You know, like the couple who fights because it equals makeup sex. Everybody was flowing with me until I said that. You know, you, listen, because that's the only way they know how to reconnect is for tragedy 
to, come on, and it's the same kind of thinking that's present within the church of we're going to fall, there's going to be a falling away, but that's just the way the pattern goes. That's not the way the pattern is supposed to go. It's supposed to go from glory to glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. And inside of our transgenerational consciousness, we must then begin to understand if you and I are in an extended manifestation of renewal, it's because he's trying to position us to be the type of wineskin that can hold a measure that's too big for one generation. It's the cup that runs over and begins to flow oil from Aaron's head to his beard all the way to the skirts of his garment. That's the measure that Yahweh's trying to bring us into. It's a measure that's identified uh, throughout, throughout Isaiah. As a matter of fact, let's just go to Isaiah 60 again and we'll, we'll, we'll start jumping in here. Renewal. When, oh, no, let's don't go there. Okay, you can turn there if you want to, but I probably won't go. Who knows whether we will or not. Okay, so, 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 so which one's revival? When, when eight people get on the boat that Noah built or when eight people get off the boat that Noah built? Because we only seem to think revival is keeping the people from drowning in the storm. Therefore, we see every time God moves, we see it as a means to save people's lives when it actually is permission to move into a colonization of a blank canvas for a globe crying out for an image bearer. All right, so let's think about this. Noah built a boat to save his family. True and really, really, really immature definition of what Noah built. Noah built an incubator for a new world. And if we miss that what God's trying to do with a little group of people he saved from the storm is teach us how to fill the earth with other people that look like us because we so look like him that we've become the repeatable pattern. See, see this. Then, then what we'll do is we'll say... There's, there's, you know, it's just get, get his, just don't let them drown. And, and if, 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 if that's all Noah's doing, Noah's a failure. If Noah's trying to repopulate the earth with people that look like Noah, he's an absolute success. Therefore, there is a measure of colonization that is to come on the end of reformation that is going to require us to go through a process of renewal. Okay, so. (laughs) hmm. All right, so Noah builds the incubator for a new world and race. He builds something mocked and rejected in his day but filled with all the seed necessary for a new world. Many times we miss the reformation aspect of revival and we start to try to take the dominion revelation away from what God's doing because that's the part that's going to be judged and we'll take the nobody comes into revival and talks about authority because that's the part that's going to be judged nobody's going to come teach you about order because that's the part that other people are going to disagree with so what they want is they want to, to make revival super 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 basic And they miss that it's actually an invitation into a measure of the manifestation of the not just spirit of God, but the spirit world God dwells in coming (laughs) as, as, as much as I am the bride of Christ, I am ruling or governing the bride of heaven. All right. (laughs) So. So the son wants to marry the bride that is the church. Equally, heaven is looking for his bride, which is the earth. That's why the end of Revelation is not about the end of the world. It's about the marriage of the new heavens and the new earth. And many, many, everybody is okay if I start talking about a new creation. Nobody's okay if I start talking about the new creation. He says, as long as 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, is just about a man, we're good. But Galatians, Paul jumps over and starts talking about ones that are neither of the circumcision or the uncircumcision, but they're actually new creations. 
Okay, so, so understand that Romans 8 is the cry of fallen creation to find a renewal of the image that was forfeited by way of Adam and the earth was crying out for a man to get freed from his futility so a cosmos could get freed from her futility. So this is what you have to understand then, what then is Noah doing? Is knowing Noah really, really passionate about saving those eight people? I, I found seven times where God spoke audibly to Noah during the process of the building of the ark. Seven times he speaks audibly to Noah. What, what did the encounter for Noah look like? Noah got slain in the spirit and all of his family got saved. No, the encounter for Noah was, I'm going to give you some blueprints. M many people miss, come on, every one of, the, one of the marks of every place God's moving historically in the earth right now is apostolic teaching. And, and, and 20 years ago, apostolic teaching was nowhere near revival. Revival was all being led by evangelists. Right? Because that was a gift that was honored. Therefore, it was a gift that was given permission to function. Then the prophetic begins to come in. Fewer people were able to honor the prophetic. Let me say it like this. There's a lot less people interested in honoring prophets than there are people interested in honoring evangelists. Therefore, you had mass of people participating in revivals led by evangelists because they were permitted to honor that. Then when the prophet... Come on. The prophetic move of the Spirit begins to come in. We see a greater measure of the outpouring of the Spirit being participated in by fewer people because fewer people are willing to recognize and honor the prophetic. I'm going to talk about this now. See, the Bible says if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you'll receive a prophet's reward. Many people want the prophetic, but they don't want to name a prophet. And if you're unwilling to call a prophet a prophet... If you don't receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, there's a reward you're never going to get to. So if an evangelist is leading something, you can get massive groups of people to say evangelist. Therefore, they can receive the fruit of the gift of the evangelist functioning in the church. I still don't believe they received it for what it was supposed to do, which was equip the saints to be evangelistic. It becomes more somebody you can live vicariously through because they're being used to win people to do what they're actually supposed to be equipping you to do. And I'm telling you, listen, I believe we're missing the gifts of Jesus because we will not honor the gifts of the Spirit, and we're missing the gifts of the Spirit because we'll not honor the gifts of Jesus. There are nine gifts of the Spirit. There are four gifts of Christ. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers. So what's happening in, now, watch this. There's a renewal that's beginning to come where God's beginning to bring apostolic teaching into manifestations of the Spirit where if you, but where, where if, if 20 years ago, if God was moving somewhere, we would say things like, it was amazing, nobody even got to speak. And now we're saying, oh, thank God for what I just heard because it gives me permission not just to have had another experience in the floor, but I'm actually getting some blueprints on how to build something that can become an incubator for a new race. There's a reformation that's going to become a repopulation as people, give big, as people are given permission to become the most authentic versions of who they've been designed to be. So we're, so primarily the message of revival in the past has been about the, your depravity. This one's about beloved identity. This one, instead of the message being about you're sinful and you need to deal with it, this one's become you're loved and you need to deal with it. And it's actually harder to deal with your loved than it is to deal with your broken. Because everybody agrees that they're broken. Come on, if I came in here and told you about how bad your sin was and how you need, and then everybody in the room would say, yes, amen, yes, amen. But if I start saying, <laughs> if I start saying he's fascinated with you, that he actually likes your feet more than you like his, then, oh, wait a minute now. Now there's a measure of exchange that starts to happen that looks more like Song of Solomon then it looks like hellfire and brimstone, get right, repeat the prayer, my God, never do it again. All right, so the shift 
into renewal is significant because what Noah built was a manifestation of revival. I'm just using this as a, as a picture. It, it was keeping people from drowning in the flood waters. But the assignment did not stop with people not drowning in the flood waters. At some point in time, a people had to move into renewal and it had a cosmic impact those people's willingness to move into renewal. Their, their message of their life did not then become, thank God we didn't drown. It became, we've got a blank canvas. Let's start to dream this thing into existence. All right. Noah builds something mocked and rejected in his day, but filled with all of the seed necessary for a new world. Fill what you build with family and be content and learn to pass the test of rejection. That family is the key to the colonization that is to come. Noah's name means rest. Be at rest with eight people. If you trust that all eight are family. Because all we need to repopulate the globe that was currently under a state of judgment, all we need is one family to stick together, weather the storm, and come out on the other side with a blank canvas beginning to name everything that needs to be named, renaming what needs to be renamed. Every person in this room has the seed of Noah in them. Look out. Right? Every person in this room, some of their DNA is traced back to Noah. There's a lot of DNA you could have come from other than Noah's. Have we not, had we not had an antediluvian civilization that came on on the other side of this great dramatic flood? What did Yahweh want? He, want, he wanted Noah to be able to speak 400 years later into an Abraham that would speak into an Isaac, that a Jacob would become an Israel that would begin to produce tribal identification. All right, so, so let's just, let's just, let's camp out a little bit on this idea that Noah comes out and nothing that is named looked the way it looked before it started to rain. I mean, what was a desert cannot be desert anymore because it just experienced 40 days and 40 nights of rain. Now, now remember, remember, I, I taught this in the past and, and showed you, I can show you the timeline. I think it took somewhere around 80 years for Noah to build the boat. Would you spend 80 years of your life building something eight people were interested in being a part of? So there has to become this contentment on the inside of you to say, everybody's not going to get it, but the ones that do are going to reform the planet. And I think that's, that's essential for us to understand because if not, we'll dumb the move of the spirit down in order that the move of the spirit might have more mass appeal. And this is, this has historically happened when God begins to move and persecution begins to come. Oftentimes people who don't understand the responsibility of reformation, they begin to back away and they try to have this kind of ecumenical, this kind of ecumenical mindset of we're going to make sure that we're not offending anybody. And I'm telling you, it's impossible to do what Yahweh wants you to do without offending a group of people who have predetermined this is what revival is supposed to look like. And I'm telling you, it's supposed to look like a group of people so being seated in authentic beloved identity that they have no problem believing that they can start renaming things based on the fact that they've gone through a reformation of their image. Now, now this, this part is huge to me, okay? Oh. It'll take a father confidently seated in rest to take time to build an ark for a family. However, when we think generationally, we're given permission to begin to build strategically 
because we understand what we're building is not actually for the earth. First, what we're building is for the family. Wait a minute now. How do, how do, how, how do we do something that, er, how do we give the world something everybody wants? You don't, you don't it doesn't work that way. You're, you become super content to say, those are my people. And if nobody else gets it, and it takes 400 years for anybody to even realize it was a big deal, I'm okay because I know that in the exchange of the secret place, I've given, been given permission for this measure of authenticity. And, and, and this thing shifts so early on in revival for me, six and a half years ago, lots of laying in the floor, covering myself with my handkerchief, shaking, having these encounters. These things still move in and out of my life from time to time. However, I had to, I had to go to Yahweh and say, why don't you move on me? Why do you move on me occasionally the way you used to move on me consistently when I was first in revival? And he says, I, the way that I move on you now is greater than the way that I moved on you then. And I said, no, well, no, 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 no. That, one, I like, that one feels more better when you do that one. Well, shaking, crying, slob. That, and that still happens. A lot of times now that happens in the secret place more than it happens in the public sphere. But I asked Yahweh, why did that shift? He said, well, how do I move on you now? And I had to sit and I had to think. And I'm learning that he doesn't really want me to help him. When he asks these questions, he's not really looking for me to help him. So I said, I don't know. What, how do you move on me now? He said, inspired thought. And you can value the slobbering tears that were bringing you into a new place. Can you value the whisper that's actually giving you permission to think in terms of generations and you to begin to build something that you're content that there's eight people that are a part of because those eight people are actually family Whoa, this is big. Now watch, watch this, watch this. It takes a father confidently seated in rest. What then did Bob Jones say would mark 2020 to 2029 would be a decade of rest? You and I would begin to come into a place of rest. How do you reconcile rest and revival? If the call on your life is revival, the, 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 the initial thing that would have come in my heart, if, if God... 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, had said you're going to be in revival for six and a half years, the idea would have been glorious and exhausting. Because it would have meant you go, 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 go. How do you reconcile revival and rest? You think in terms of generations. Therefore, you recognize what I need to be in order to accomplish all that I've been sent in the earth to do. What I actually need to be is faithful rather than successful. Chris and Danielle Burns are here. More, more than any song I've listened to since revival, Chris's song, Faithful, stays on a loop in my office continually. You're not looking for the big things. You're looking for the day after days. What was happening in the early days of this, God's moving and people are inviting me to come everywhere and they want to see revival. Bring it to our city and bring it to our church and God's moving. And I'm, I'm sitting up there in this little nowhere town out in the rural Hickville, middle of nowhere, in this office and I'm letting the the seed bed, come on, of a new way of doing life begin to get churned in my own heart where now I'm beginning to think in terms of not how can we do something that looks successful, but how can we be deemed as those who have been faithful? Because if we can be faithful, we actually end up in rulership without aiming at it. Remember, if you're faithful over a little thing, I'll make you ruler over much. Not even I'll let you be. I'll make you into what you weren't before you were faithful. That's why we have a lot of people who have a great skill set that never do anything great. And you have another group of people who have an inferior skill set but had a greater understanding of faithfulness. And Yahweh breathes not just on their gifting, he breathes on their heart and allows them to do something, come on, that could never have been done just by way of talent or gifting. He's looking for faithfulness. Man, how do we reconcile revival and rest? I think we graduate to an understanding of renewal, which is the season whereby we surrender to being soaked in the oil. One more minute at his feet, instead of how do we leverage what God's doing into success? 
how do we steward what God's doing until it begins to be classified as renewal? Because on the, it starts with revival, graduates to renewal. Phase three, I believe, will be reformation. There'll be a, there'll be a societal reform that'll begin to happen that will literally give us grace for colonization. Colonization, I believe, is ultimately what we were designed for. To the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. So if, if God, um, keep pointing Chris and Danielle out, I hadn't even hugged them yet, but I really want to. But you look, God's using them to be a part of something great in New Orleans, in, right on Bourbon Street, this great move of the Spirit. Is God, God doing that because there's a lot of lost people on Bourbon Street? Yes, there are a lot. Didn't, you don't have to be a prophet to recognize there's a lot of lost people. But, but really what he wants is he wants, come on, to take the street and the city and the region and bring it back into its original intention. So he's looking for a people to say, how are we gonna start this? Well, it's gonna start one drunk man at the time and one blind man at the time and one lame man at the time, but it's not just gonna stay about being about seeing the drunk person get free from alcohol and the lost person repeat the prayer. It's, it's, that's part of what we're ultimately designed to do, which is to take a place that's lost its identity and be able to bring it back into its pre-designed intention. That's apocatastasis. That's the restoration of renewal back into to original intent and if we don't move out of a let's have a, a series of meetings with lots of altar calls and call that revival we're going to miss the whisper where he begins to show us how we move into the next phase of this which is to begin to take uh, Cabarrus County and begin to take Rowan County and take China Grove and take Landis and take Huntersville and take Davidson and take Kannapolis and take Concord and begin to speak you have an assignment we're going to aim you towards Charlotte and the Queen City is going to get introduced to her king. Come on, the secret lies with Charlotte. And so we begin to see that city come back into the full intention of Yahweh concerning her identity. How is that going to happen? You're going to have to come into agreement with Yahweh's actual description of your identity. How do we, how do we move from a new creation to the new creation. The one who is a new creation gets so seated in beloved identity that he becomes an agent of transformation, but, but not by aiming at the political sphere, not by aiming at, 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 the, at what's going on in, in the world that seems influential, but to become the hidden man of mystery that's given grace and permission to leverage breakthrough because Yahweh said that one is so dear to me that not one word he speaks falls to the ground. And our words begin to have a penetrating impact. The things that we speak, regardless of who's hearing them or where we're speaking them, we begin to trust that the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead has quickened my mortal body. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit tonight then about the next phase of this, which is you coming out of agreement with inferior identification. We've entered into a new day. We've entered into a new land, and we're receiving a new name. This is, this is where we've been. We've entered into a new age. The age shifted. I'm, the, I'm six and a half years into revival, and I'm deeper, more rooted in beloved identity, more convinced I'm loved by God, more in love with God, walking closer to God than I ever have been at any other point in time in my life. And it should, we should be, on, it should be phasing out instead of intensifying. And part of it is this understanding of going sitting along with God and saying, how do, how do I give something to the next generation that's greater than what I had in you? Or, or, or they end up later on hearing our story and hoping they get their revival too. I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. This is the thing. When Yeshua, when Yeshua gives the command to go disciple nations, he doesn't know we're going to fail at that, but it's going to be okay because he'll come at the end and do for us what he told us to do. 
I, I, I say stuff like this all the time because I think it's crucial for people to move into a measure of understanding that everything he asked us to do, he intended for us to do it. Not only did he intend for us to do it, he demands that we do it because he supplied all the grace necessary to bring about the transformation he assigned us to. So he intended not for us to make converts, intended for us to disciple nations. We, we've been trying to win souls. I used the analogy recently in South Carolina. We treat souls like we're at the fair and we're trying to knock milk jugs over and we're winning souls. And the, you know what that'll do? That'll lead you to spend your life trying to get people to make decisions rather than have encounters. A decision is a, a decision is cognitive. Okay, that, that means somebody talked you into it and somebody shows you enough of the other side, they can talk you out of it. But if your transformation came by way of encounter, nobody will ever be able to talk you out of what you experienced that was not from this world. Come on, something not from this world encountered me and I'll never forget it. And I'll never go back. And one of the reasons why we have to build so much in the way of discipleship is because we've not had le legitimate transformations. We've had people who make decisions, and so you know what you have to do? You have to supply a group of friends for them. You have to give them something to do at least three days a week. You have to give them practical principles on how what the Christian faith is supposed to look like. And we are exhausted as leaders trying to provide things to hold people who made decisions instead of fueling people who have had encounters. I'm designed as a leader to give you permission to go more deeply into the manifestation of your encounter, not to... Not, All right, all right, it, and, and, and I can always bring the necessity of the kindness of God being the foundation of the repentance. I can always bring that to you to show you one of the reasons why we're not seeing cultural transformation is because we have people who have made decisions on an intellectual level based on moral obligation rather than people who are having transformation that came at the level of encounter because they experienced the kindness of God in an hour in which they saw themselves as unlovable. All right, so... Uh, look at... Um, Go, go to Isaiah 60. I guess I am going there. I want to go to Romans 8 so bad I can't stand it because Romans 8 and Isaiah 60, 61, 62, Bren pointed out to me that those are the exits, the mile markers for where we are is I 60, 61, and 62. I stay on exit 60. The church is exit 62. So or 63. So 60, 61, 62, 63. I want to get into 65 and 66, which I think are pictures of global transformation. That's where the line starts to lay down with the lamb. And I can't wait to prove to you that has nothing to do with heaven. It's going to be awesome. As, 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 as N.T. Wright says, heaven is amazing, but it's not the end of the world. So... <laughs> <laughs> All right, let, let, let's, let's, mm, how do I want to do this? Let, let's look at, let's look at Isaiah 6, I'm going to get to Isaiah 62, but, but Isaiah 60 mar is marrying to Romans 8 for me. By the time we get to Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 66, the, the globe has transformed, which is, I believe, the cry we see in Romans 8, where creation is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. In Isaiah 60, we become the manifestation of a glory that begins to cause a cosmic response. All right. I got way too much going on in my brain. Isaiah 60 verse 1 says, rise up in splendor and be radiant for your light has dawned. Yahweh's glory now streams from you. Look carefully, darkness blankets the earth and thick gloom covers the nations. But Yahweh rises upon you. I, Romans 8. Right? The earth in futility is crying out for what? The manifestation of the sons of God to begin to operate in their radiant glory. As you and I begin to function in our radiant glory, things begin to respond to us different in a cosmic sense. I mean, <laughs> that can sound too metaphysical for you, but I actually like metaphysics because meta means beyond and physics simply means the natural. So I'm into metaphysics because I need to get beyond the natural. 
I need to begin to live. This is this was this was this has been crucial to my own thought process. This is my, my, my this is my pineal gland. This is the place of transformation where we lose the division between the right and left hemisphere of the brain and we begin to operate in wholeness. The whole heart can begin to function as a whole mind. But as long as the heart is fractured, so will then be the thought process. That's why repentance, metanoia, to change the way you think has to begin with kindness. If it begins with kindness, then repentance is not just the way you change your behavior. It's how you get your heart healed. And there's a lot of people sorry for their sins broken in their hearts who can't figure out why they can't get out of cycles of dysfunction as it relates to sin because they saw him as somebody who paid the price to forgive their sins and failed to announce that when he said why he was here, Luke 4, 18, it was an Isaiah 61 declaration that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the lowly to bind up the brokenhearted and to set those that are at captive, to set them free, to give them liberty or even liberality. So, so why, is all of, why is all that essential? Because if the foundation of your repentance was not kindness, you missed the first essential shift in thinking. The goodness of God that brings men to repentance. That's Christos, right? So the goodness of God or the kindness of God brings men to metanoia to change the way that you think. The kindness of God causes you to change the way you think. What then should have been the first thought process? I'm sinful and God's holy. Those things are true. But the foundation or the beginning or the genesis of your metanoia was supposed to be Christos. He's kind. If it wasn't, then could it be that you saw yourself still as one needing to measure up in order to be accepted instead of one who allowed loving kindness to come heal the fracture in the heart that was really the root behind the manifestation of your behavior? Change the way you think, change the way you think. That that changing the way we think, a misunderstanding there caused us to get people to make decisions. And and if it's all about getting people to make decisions, then just tell them a little bit about heaven and a little bit about hell, and you just made the choice super easy. Therefore, we made the aim, get them to heaven. Instead of getting their heart healed. Instead of dealing with every fracture in the heart, we've got to change the way that they think. Yeah, and the Bible also says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. See, we, can, we have people who repented of their sin but never went through a process of re-identification. Because you are as you think in your heart. That's the point of identification. All right, man. Whoo. So what he's doing is he's healing the heart so that the heart can generate a fault process that becomes a a re-identification and that re-identification is then dealing with every other thought process. I'm, I'm calling them crowned paradigms. He gives you beauty for ashes. He gives the garland. It's the headdress. It's a turban. He actually wraps your thinking inside of a royal dimension where you begin to identify yourself the way he identifies you and you quit functioning as a slave when he actually adopted you and made you a prince. There's this, there's this tension right now, and, 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 and I, don't even, I don't even pay attention to this kind of stuff, but this one has fascinated me a little bit, is, is the, the, the Harry and Meghan leaving the royal family. So they've made a decision to leave the royal family. Now, they're, they're, right now they're saying she can still be the Duchess of Sussex and he can still be the Duke of Sussex, but what they will lose is they will lose the title of royals. They can, he can be a, a duke and she can be a duchess, but they won't be identified as royals. Okay. So they'll have regional authority, but they won't have cosmic authority. And what happens when you and I fail to identify as royals, we may have a measure of influence, but we'll never have the cosmic influence that we were designed for. And, and so what we do is in order to stay in a state of independence, we get disconnected from the throne. And every problem in the world is an authority problem. 
every problem in the world is an authority problem. You see people whose lives are messed up, you're not going to be able to trace it back to circumstances and situations. You're going to be able to trace it back to the seed of lawlessness where they have been unwilling to allow anybody to speak into the chaos of what's going on in their world. So at best, they'll become great pretenders with regional influence, but they'll never have the cosmic rule that they were designed for because they won't allow the seed of lawlessness to be identified on the inside of them. And they'll start punching at and trying to poke holes in what they see functioning in other people that they've been unwilling to see their marriage fit inside of that frame. So they... So they have to pretend that they're not spinning out of control. But you can tell by the violence of the reaction that they're actually spinning out of control or you just mind your business and keep on moving. See how that, ha- see how that, see how that whole thing goes? <laughs> so then what happens is if you and I don't get re-identified and come into that royal posture, then we're going to miss the measure of influence that's supposed to be accomplished, listen, by way of our identity, not gift. A gift may bring you a measure of breakthrough, but a re-identification will give you cosmic influence. So there's a, we, we, we've entered into a new age. Revival's happening everywhere. No, I, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything close to anything like it. I think every spiritual son that's joined to me that I'm in relationship with could at their own house be in extended revival meetings right now. We left Panama City. Panama City, I don't even know if they believed in revival <laughs> in the past. I'm serious. We left there and people came to move the chairs out of the gym. And when they got there to move the chairs out of the gym, God began to visit and people began to gather. And they spontaneously called a service out of people coming to move the chairs out of the gymnasium. And they end up gathering together again that night. Out of, and, what's, and, 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 and Jimmy and Tina Lovejoy been going into extended meetings with a measure of glory there. Matt and Jamie Brown did their first extended service where they called an additional service. God began to move. Chris and Nikki Mathis and Canada have been in extended service meetings and people are getting healed all over the place. We're, we're in a different age. Things have shifted and, and, and there's a little bit of a now what happening on the inside of it because I don't want to ride the wave of momentum. I want to receive the keys for transformation. I, I want to see a reformation come out of this. I, I want to see a people graduate from great meetings to global transformation, to the school system being affected, to the crime rate being affected, to the divorce rate being affected, come on, to cancer being affected. I want to see this thing start to do what Yahweh designed it to do, which is flood the earth with the knowledge of the glory of God. Not great meetings. That's why people are experiencing a significant move of God, and it's not leading to a bunch of extra meetings. They're gathering. Oh, you have to gather. You have to get together. You have to spontaneously gather. But it's not going to be about we're going to go every single night because this thing's going to burn out pretty quick and we better make, enjoy it while it's here. Because we, through our failure, have created a doctrine that says revival has a shelf life. And Yahweh never designed it to have a shelf life. We just failed to understand what he was giving us was not a booster shot to give us some extra meetings. The glory of God was permission for us to see, first of all, who he is correctly so that he could then begin to talk to us about who we are. And that transformation could become the beginning, the seed of cosmic reform. Who do you say I am? Who do you say? He starts with this. Who do they say that the Son of Man is? Some Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist reincarnated. Some say that you're Jeremiah. He said, but who do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Here's your identification. You figured out who I am. This is what he said. Flesh and blood hath not revealed that to you. In essence, he's saying you didn't get that from me. You, you, you already understood that I'm the gate to get to the voice of my father. And my father's been talking to you. 
And now that you've named who I am, the Christ of the Son of the living God, let me start talking to you about who you are. In our track, it looks like this. Once we finally discerned he was good and we got rooted inside of the revelation that he's good, he then begins to turn and talk to us about being beloved. And if we can inherit the next measure of revelation concerning his identity as good, he'll give us the next level of revelation. Why? Because it is unsafe for us to know more about us without first knowing more about him. And a lot of people are trying to find out their identity, and it's all hidden in his identity. And once you begin to identify him as he is, he returns and begins to identify you as you should be. Your name shall be called Petra. Upon this rock I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'll give unto you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Hello? On the rock of the revelation of who I am, I will give you the identification of who who you are. So the the shift in ages, this transformation that we're seeing happen all over the place is an announcement that we've come into a new epoch. We're in a new eon. We're in a new era. We're in a new age. Don't say season. This is not a new season because you just prophesied winter's coming back around. Hello? You're in in an age of righteousness. You're in an age of rest. We're in an age of outpouring. We're in an age of the miraculous. People are being healed. And, and, you know, we're, we're not even having to do the way we did healing before, which is find the guy who can heal people and bring him in and let him heal people. There are people being healed because they come into an atmosphere where the sickness is a violation of the peace, rest, and breakthrough that's available in the room. This is a lot of, so you're seeing unbelievable miracles happening atmospherically. Now I know the Bible said, if you call for the being sick among you, call for the elders of the church, anoint them with oil and pray the prayer of faith that prays the sick. But when Peter and John were going up together at the hour of prayer in the ninth hour, they did not get oil out and pray for that man in order for him to be healed. Right? Nor when Peter is going up to pray, does his effervescence touch a lame man and the lame man get healed because they used the formula. Okay. He never gave us those instructions so that we could create a formula. Amen. Right? So, so we, we're moving into a new age. We're moving into a new era. Isaiah 60, you're rising up in splendor. You're radiant. Your light has dawned. Yahweh's glory now streams from you. Look carefully. Darkness blankets the earth. Thick gloom covers the nations. But Yahweh arises upon you. And the brightness of his glory appears over you. Nations will be attracted to your radiant light. And kings to the sunrise glory of your new day. Your new day. Now, so Isaiah, Isaiah, this is, this is so cool to me. I just, this stuff fires me up. Isaiah 60, we find out verse 3, we're in a new day. Isaiah 60 verse 10, we find out that we're in a new land, the restoration of Zion, the realm of Zion. I, I'm going to tell you that in, in my private world, Everywhere I've seen or see or am seeing Eden, I'm now identifying as Zion. Okay, that the prophetic picture of the Garden of Eden is the realm of Zion. Okay, here's what's interesting. Under an inferior covenant, when God wanted to give an inheritance to people, he would give them a holy land or a promised land. Okay. Under a superior covenant, he gave us the earth and is now giving us grace to trans- see the earth transform into the Holy Land. You, you can travel to the Holy Land or believe everywhere you travel is the Holy Land. It's cheaper to travel and go where Jesus used to walk than it is to stand still until he walks with you here. 
I say, I, I, if I go to Jerusalem, I feel the presence. It's walking where Jesus. I've been so many. You don't know how many times I've been. I have been with a camera shoved up my nose and preached on the Sea of Galilee and preached in the Kidron Valley. And I preached and the camera shoved up my face. I stood out there on the boat. It was right here in this sea where he said, cast your net. On the other side, I've done all that. I've been there. I've been there. Stayed in the hotel, ate the buffet, bought the wooden carved statue of David with his sheep on his shoulder. I got one. I got five smooth stones right from the same river bed where David pulled out and that's all fine if it's if that if that does it for you awesome and good but I'm telling you somebody's got to feel him on Bourbon Street not just feel him in Jerusalem somebody's got to feel him in downtown Charlotte and not just feel him in Jerusalem somebody's got to believe that my kids carry the same measure of presence to that school that David did when he took that slingshot out and he defeated that giant we're gonna have to see things differently in order to experience the transformation we've been designed for. So there's a restoration, there's a new day, then there's a restoration of a new land. Then Isaiah 62, verse 2. Let's look at that one. Isaiah 62, verse 2. I'll get to this one quick because there's somewhere we need to go. For for Zion's sake, how can I keep silent? For Jerusalem's sake, how can I remain quiet? I will keep interceding until her righteousness breaks forth like the blazing light of dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. Now, you can marry that to Isaiah 60, which is the streaming of the light of the glory of God. But I want you to look at verse 2. Nations will see your victory vindication. Every king will witness your blinding radiance. You will be called by a brand new name. It's a new age. It's a new age. It's a new realm. And you get a new name. If we say the time has come and we say the land is being redeemed and you don't allow yourself to be re-identified in that process, we will actually miss that the key to the transformation of the land is your re-identification. Why? Because the earth in futility was subjected to futility in Romans 8 because of a man in slavery. The the futility in the man created the futility in the cosmos and the earth is groaning and travailing for the manifestation of a whole man who looks like the son of God, right? Earth groans and travails for the manifestation of the sons of God, not not looking for apostles and prophets, groaning and travailing for the manifestation of the sons of God. Don't set your aim too low. Everything we're experiencing in the world of gifting is a means whereby we get rooted enough in beloved identity that he can start talking to us about how we were designed to become agents of the glory of God because our chief identification is sons of God. Chief identification is sons of God. It's not secondary. It's not sons of God on the way to becoming apostles and prophets. It's apostles, prophets giving you permission to become sons of God so that the earth can get what she's crying out for, which is not a handful of men on fire. It's a group of people as a family that have been re-identified that are becoming image bearers. So I want to talk to you about the name. If we're being re-identified, let's talk about the name. Go a little bit further. Okay. So verse two, nations will see your victory vindication and every king will witness your blinding radiance. You will be called by a brand new name given to you from the mouth of Yahweh himself. You will be a beautiful crown held high in the hand of Yahweh, a royal crown of splendor held in the open palm of your God. You will never again be called the abandoned one, nor will your land be called deserted. Why is the land called deserted? Because you've been functioning as if you're abandoned. Right? See the connection. When he starts talking about who you are, he'll start talking about the land. You will never again be called the abandoned one, nor will your land be called deserted. But you will be called my delight is in you. Hephzibah. Not only does it tell you you get a new name, it tells you the name, Hephzibah. Hephzibah. What's your name? Hephzibah. You're welcome. (laughs) Hephzibah. It means the Lord takes delight in you. Remember we've been talking for, listen, we've been talking for weeks now 
This is what we've been talking about. We've been talking for weeks now about a new age that brings us into a new land that gives us a new name. And I think the Lord takes delight in you is the graduate level of beloved identity. Not just he loves you because there's some some of us that feel like he loves us because he's good, but I'm worthless. No, he takes delight in you, but you don't know how messed up I am. Yeah, but I do know that Micah 7 said he delights in showing mercy. So mercy is not something God does because of how bad you need it. He gets excited in showing mercy. He delights in showing mercy. Your name is the Lord delights in you. There's a transformation that's not going to begin to take place until you and I are willing to sit still and accept that God doesn't just love us because he's God and he has to. He actually takes delight in us. You delight in me. You enjoy me. You don't love me because you're good and you tolerate how much. You, listen, this is, this is what religion does. I hate religion. God, I hate religion. I, I, I thought I would mature out of that. I'm maturing into it. I didn't hate it enough when I thought I hated it. I, don't, I didn't hate it then like I hate it now. This is, what, this is what religion does. Religion takes immature sincerity and makes it hypocrisy. And because you're not fully mature, You think you're hypocritical. What you actually have is infantile sincerity, which God's fascinated with. I wish somebody would have told me that. Because this is what what the pharisaical spirit does. It says you've got to be functioning up here or it's not sincere. And he said, I don't care how small it is as long as it's sincere. I don't care how many times you mess up as long as it's sincere. I delight in showing mercy. So you falling and getting back up doesn't mess with me. Doesn't make me change how I feel about you. It just lets me show you a measure of my delight that I couldn't show you before when you were trying to act like you had it all together. I just need you to say, hey, I need mercy. And he says, that's awesome. Is this one of the ways I delight myself in you? And and the Lord's been talking to me about immature sincerity. And there are people in this room, you feel like you're insincere because you don't measure up yet. You're sincere because you still want to. God, if I had this 20 years ago. Somebody would have told me this 20 years ago when I felt like I was a failure, when I shied away from his presence, when I recoiled whenever he came near, because I knew I wasn't full grown yet. You're not supposed to be full grown yet. You're just supposed to have infantile sincerity. I'm not there, but I want to be. Come on. I'm not there, but I'm here again. I hadn't made it through everything. I'm not still struggle. I, I still get knocked off track. I still lose my way from time to time. But there's something in me that wants everything you have for me. And I'm going to refuse to call myself insincere because my sincerity is immature. What, what measure of his delight have we cut ourselves off from because we're abusing ourselves because we need mercy again. And it's new every morning. And it endures forever. I got mercy again today. It's new every morning and endures forever. And he doesn't say, oh, let I show him mercy again. He delights in showing mercy. And you know what we make? Listen, we're, we're huge on that as long as it's for the unbeliever. As long as everybody in the room will shout when God gives mercy to the unbeliever. But what about the individual who needs it to be new again in the morning because they're maturing in their sincerity 
Come on, it doesn't mean you're going to have an excuse to be dysfunctional the rest of your life. It's going to mean if you don't allow him to start delighting in you where you are, you're never going to become who you are actually designed to be. You're going to have to realize he's not staying away from you until you grow up. He's not staying away from you until you're not tempted anymore. He's not staying away from you until all your thoughts are pure. He said, I'm coming to delight myself in you in the middle of an hour in which you need mercy. And that becomes this unbelievable Grace to grow up because you can't legally grow spiritually outside of presence. And if you believe he's withdrawing from you because you're in need of mercy instead of the fact he delights in. Hephzibah. What's your name? Hephzibah. Are you kidding me? What's your name? He delights in you. But but because for years I thought if I could go to him and say, I'm broken and I'm perverted and I'm compromised, it would move his heart. Yeah. Right? Yes. Did, yes. Right? Like, and 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 that's how we stay in revival. Find another person who can identify how broken they are. And he's saying, Well, there is a group of people coming, they're gonna nations are gonna run to their streaming light of their glory. Who are they going to be? What's their name going to be? Hephzibah. Hephzibah. Oh, I'm going to talk about Hezekiah tomorrow night, but I'm going to talk about Hephzibah. I can't, I'm telling you, I'm so stirred up about this. When God showed me Hephzibah, God showed me Hephzibah, and I begin to remember Mike Bickle had a dream years ago where he was standing before they had ever had the first One Thing conference. He was standing in front of tens of thousands of young people and he was screaming, your name is Hephzibah. Your name is Hephzibah. Your name is Hephzibah. And in that moment, when I remembered that dream, immediately I began to think of Luke 15. I heard Mike Bickle say years ago, he thinks every Christian should read Luke 15 once a week, every day, every year of their life. Once a week, 52 times a year, you read through Luke 15. Lost coin, lost sheep, lost son. Let me, let me can, I, can I just do this real quick? Let me just, this part right here, this is so big, because I think if we, don't, if, we don't, but if we don't understand that he delights in showing mercy, okay, we, you need to first of all understand lost coin, lost sheep, lost son. None of them deal with the issue of ownership. They're all three stories of displacement. The woman owned the coin all along. It just wasn't in the right place. The man owned the sheep all along. It just wasn't in the right place. The father was the father to the son all along. The son was just outside of the position he was designed to be in. What mercy does is repositions you to come back into the place where your full value can be seen instead of trying to manifest value okay manifest value outside of presence when you and i attempt to manifest value outside of presence and we turn to the gospel intellectual we right we begin to turn it into something scholastic and academic and if you were smart enough to get it and understand the deep things and so and it became this this thing of where you know seminary was a requirement for discipleship now not even just ministry and we begin to create this exclusivity whereby we elevated ourselves based on what we knew rather than seeing ourselves get promoted into an inheritance that is going to require the revelation that he delights in me so it's, it's my new name Hephzibah. So in Luke 15, you just, I could do all of them, if, if, but I, mean, I could do all of them right now. But I'm going I'm to I'm skip to the last one, which I, I, we used to call the story of the prodigal son. I, I, I tried to fix that and call it the story of the redeemed heir, and I was wrong on that too. It's actually the story, come on, of the faithful father. The whole, the whole story is not about a son. The story, the, the, come on, the one you need to pay attention to in the story is not the son. The one you need to pay attention to in the story is the father. The whole, the whole story is about the father. Okay. 
And what happened was, you, you, you know the story, the son, the son asked for the portion of goods that falleth to him. There's a measure that was to belong to his brother, there was a measure that was belonged to him. Neither one of them were to be inherited until the death of the father. In essence, when the son comes to the father and asks for the portion that belongs to him, he is in the Jewish culture saying to the father, I wish you were dead. Give me the portion of goods that belongs to me. The father gives him the portion of goods that belongs to him. You can actually find that in Dr. Simmons' footnotes, I believe, of Luke 15. He gives the son. The son goes out, takes that part of his inheritance. The son, we, we, we made the son greedy, and I don't think it's fair because he never asked for anything that wasn't supposed to be his. See, the, the son wasn't greedy. He was lawless because a greedy man would have wanted more than the portion that belonged to him. Most scholars believe the son had to settle for less than the portion he would have received had he stayed until the father died. Can't, can't prove or disprove that, but a lot of scholars believe that. So the son goes out. He takes the measure of the inheritance that belongs to him. He, re, he wasted on, on, on harlots and riotous living. He's, he just, just parties and blows the whole thing. You know, it's a great story. He, you know, real, real encouraging. He loses everything. He ends up farming pigs. He's feeding something he's not allowed to eat. He's feeding something that can never nourish him. Come on. So he's, feed, he's feeding the pigs. And the Bible says something really fascinating. It says, and one day he came to himself. One day he said, this is not who I am. See, the, one of the first things that will get you out of slop is agreement with who you actually are. And some of you think you please God because you roll around in that and tell him how dirty you are. And he needs you to come to yourself. One of the first ways you'll get back into the Father's presence is to identify, I'm better than this. This is not actually who I am. I may be struggling with this, but he delights in showing mercy. I may be, I'm, this, this is filth. Listen, as long as you think dirty, you'll act filthy. And the first thing that has to happen is you have to let the kindness of God come re-identify you and say, there's no way I should be living like this. Not when I have a father like the one that I have. Yes. And the church is good. Listen, the, the, this, is a, this is an analogy about saved people. He's in the family. This is not about people outside of the family. Religion will clap and do backflips when you talk about God showing mercy to somebody that's not in the family. But when somebody was in the house, in the right position, where they were supposed to be, and then went out and wasted everything, then all of a sudden we act like the mercy is not available for that individual. Come on, like, like you get grade A mercy if you've never been in the family, and then you don't get mercy if you have, or you get a weaker manifestation of mercy if you fell away. Uh, no, no, no. The father stood on the porch and watched for the son and wanted the day to come when the son realized, I'm better than this. This is not who I am. You know the story. He goes walking back to the father. He, he, he rehearsed his speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me as one of your hired servants. Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me as one of your hired servants. Man, there's a lot here. So he starts moving toward the father. The father starts moving toward him. They have the embrace. The father kisses him over and over. That's what that word literally means right there. The father kisses him over and over and kisses him over and over. And he starts, if he'd stop kissing me, I'd do my speech. This is, how, this is something, this is what I think we do. I think sometimes we stop God from kissing people to get them to confess how nasty that they are because we think the breakthrough is going to come if they can come into agreement with the fact that they're nasty. They know that they're nasty. The father knows that they're nasty. He's trying to fix it with a kiss. What if the next phase of revival is not going to be God coming into agreement with their filthy. It's going to be God saying, none of that stops my lips from finding the place where I'm able to properly identify them. So just kissing him over. Just kiss. I can just see him just kissing him over and over. Just kissing him over and over. Just kissing him over and over. Kissing him. But if you'll stop that, I'll tell you. I got a speech prepared and I'll tell you I've sinned against. He knows that. Just let him kiss you. Stop this. Man. Just some, I just feel like saying tonight, some, somebody quit trying to convince him that you're really, 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 really sorry because you think you being really, really, really sorry is what's going to keep you on track. He'll kiss you into faithfulness if you'll let him. It won't be your speech that brought your breakthrough. 
It'll be his kisses that established you in a place where you felt safe with him showing his delight in you, regardless of how you smell and regardless of what you were rolling in before you got here. His kisses will re-identify you. So this is what he says. He says, he says, Father, Father, okay, 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 thank you for the kisses, but I gotta tell you something I've seen. <laughs> Can you see this happening? I, I sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the, the father will not allow the next part of that to come out of his mouth. The point the father interrupts his speech is right before the boy says, I'll work my way back into your favor. I sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but just stop. Don't talk to me about you being a slave when I'm this interested in showering kisses on you. This is the gospel. I'm saying this, is, this makes the religious spirit go, no, 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 I'm saying, because many people will not embrace the kiss because they've not earned it yet. And he delights in showing mercy. If I, do get, if I can prove for the next five years that I'll be faithful, then I can earn my way back. He said, ring right now robe right now let's throw a party right now I'm, uh, this everything you came in here with i already have something to cover your filth and your shame and what you need to do is you need to deal with the fact that my love is so big that i actually delight in covering up everything you just made a mess of interesting interesting the son's dealing with shame the brother's dealing with performance orientation and do you know what the father won't let the shameful son do? Stay in the measure of shame that leads to performance. I'm going to interrupt your speech right there because you're not going to be a hireling in a place where those kind of kisses are available. I'm telling you what, I'm telling you a lot of what the church means when they say we need a revival. Need, what, they, what they really mean is we want a bunch of lost people to realize how filthy they are so we can have a moral, trans, a, a moral transformation take place in the nation. And I don't think we need a movement of morality. I think we need a movement of mercy. I feel as, I, I want to say this the right way. I feel as morally mature as I ever have any point in my life, and there's never been another period of my life there's been a close second. I feel, as, I feel like I'm in a, a moral incubator. Like Yahweh said, you're in a bubble. You can't, you can't sin right now. Just, it's not, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be appealing or enjoyable to even think about it. It's just this great place. And, 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 and you know how, how bad I tried to work my way into that? And he said, the only way you'll get there is I'll have to kiss you there. Your, your transportation into the realm of holiness that you want, you're only going to find your way there by way of kisses. That messes with you, especially a man who thinks you could get there by the sweat of your brow. Save the kissy stuff for somebody else. I'm a man. No, 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 no. He's, can you see that son? God, I stink. I stink that stuff. Stop, I stink. Do you know what I was doing yesterday? I don't have anything you gave me. I don't have any of it. All that that you gave me, I don't have any of it. He said, I, <laughs> my goal was never to get stuff to you. My goal was for you to understand how good I am so that you'd never want to leave. You'd never want to leave presents for possessions. Hephzibah. He delights in you. Would you let yourself receive this? Because all of the stuff I've been prophesying about, we're moving into according to Isaiah 60, Isaiah 61, Isaiah 62. We're going to get to 63, 64, 65, 66. It's going to be a long, long, long journey. As we keep traveling m m until the line lays down with the lamb inside of time, that's where we're going. Devouring beasts become vegetarians by the time you get to chapter 66. It's where we're going. 
And I think there's a pause. Y'all was stopping right now saying, listen, let me tell you something. The only group of people that are ever going to be able to get to everything I'm showing, he's showing me some stuff right now about the globe. And, and it's, it's happening. It's, I could talk about it all night tonight. It's, things are happening that he's asking us to identify, come into agreement with. And they're happening immediately as soon as we do it. There's a meeting happening right now that's a miracle in the Middle East that's directly connected to us. Right, it's happening right now. And he's letting us experience this measure of breakthrough. And I think there's a, there's a spot right here where he's saying, do you want to go all the way? Yes. Hefzibah. Giving you a new age, hallelujah. New land, Zion, hallelujah. A new name, as long as it's just new name. Right, as long as that's generic terminology, everybody's fine. But the moment he says, this is, this is your new name, your new name, your new name, your new name. I'm giving my people a new name and the new name is not I tolerate you. It's not that I've forgiven you. It's not that I gave grace to you. It's Hephzibah. I take delight in you. Could the only legal gate to delighting yourself in the Lord be to believe that he delights in you? Is that an exchange you can participate in if he finds you less than delightful? Because if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Could it be that he is not first asking us to delight in him, he's first asking us to believe that he finds us delightful. Then watch the ease come to the place of exchange where he begins to give you the desires of your heart. Hephzibah. What's your new name? The Lord takes delight in me. I'm... Beats the hell out of sinner saved by grace, doesn't it? Sinner saved by grace. Praise God. Amen. Bro, praise God. Saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Saved by grace. Amen. I'm forgiven. I'm just an old sinner. Saved by grace. Have sabah. What? Yeah. Have sabah. My lips are taking aim at your face, and you better get ready because there'll be no room for shame there. You won't get to this next place and say, I earned it, I fasted enough, and I prayed enough, and I was consecrated enough, and, and, a, and a big shot preacher laid hands on me twice, and now I'm here. How are you going to get there? Well, I just dared to stand one night in the middle of immature sincerity. And hear him call me Hephzibah. I'm just, all I'm doing, I'm not teaching, preaching tonight. I'm telling you about the trip I'm on right now. Hephzibah. You know, if I could pray four hours a day, maybe then it's Hephzibah. Right? And he's saying, I'm going to, in the middle of immature sincerity, I'm going to kiss you with a new name, Hephzibah. I feel like joy is going to begin to come to people all over this movement because you're going to realize it wasn't hypocrisy. It was just immature sincerity. Oh, you just helped me. I'm not a pretender. I just have a baby sincerity. But it's sincerity nonetheless. Why? Because you won't. Even where you're missing it, you don't want to. And he said, that's what I'm looking for. Why, why, why would God be moved by the areas where I don't measure up? Because he delights in showing mercy. And your name is takes delight in you. Therefore, you don't have to wait until you don't need mercy for him to start taking delight in you. Hephzibah right now. Oh, if when I was going through puberty, somebody had whispered <laughs> the word Hephzibah to me. Right? You know what I mean? You know, in the deepest, darkest struggles of your life where you thought, if I can get over this, he'll love me. If I can get over this, then I can pray. If I can get over this, then he'll use me. And the whole time he was going, I delight in showing mercy. It's just been, you've never been, you've never been introduced to my kindness. 
And that's the foundation of all legitimate repentance. This is a very for the family talk tonight. You feel it? It's a very for, because I need need people in my life to understand that he takes delight in your immature sincerity. And I'm saying what it's done for, what this has done for me, it, it is producing some development in my interior world that I thought, I, I thought, I thought, you know, you know, for years we, we even used the analogies of, you know, weightlifting for growth by the spirit as if that's how it works. If you pick up enough heavy stuff, you'll get stronger. You know what a lot of what we've done is as stupid as weightlifting, which is picking up heavy stuff and putting it back down. That's what, that's what you're doing. What are you doing today? I'm going to pick up heavy stuff and then I'm going to put it back down. I'm not even going to move it from one place to another place. I'm going to pick it up and then I'm going to put it back down. And then maybe later I'll be able to pick up something heavier than that and put it back down too. And this is exactly, we, we laugh at it, but it's exactly how we thought the spiritual world works. If we could bench press this thing right now, then we're going to be, he's going to give us more. Right? We've got we to be able to bench press this one first. No, I'm telling you, you're going to have to understand his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And what he's trying to move you into is a deeper seat of rest. And one of the things that's caused that interior rest to come to me is like, is I'm, I'm, I'm not where I want to be. No, I'm right where I want to be. I just need some growth in the area of sincerity. You know what? We keep, we keep rehearsing the speech. Father, I sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me as one. Shh. And you know what? You know what happens? You know what happens? You know what happens? The spirit of the older brother start trying to show up in the younger brother and shame will turn you into a performer. I'll pr- you don't ever, you don't ha- I'll earn my way back. And no, you won't. I'll kiss you back into a place of favor. I'll kiss you back into a place of authority. The ring doesn't just mean you're in the family. The ring means you can do transactions on my behalf. Now, you ought to have to earn your way back into that because you, no, 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 not, 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 not have sabah. Hephzibah's just there because the Father takes delight in you. God, the religion hates this. If there's a shred of a vestige on the inside of you that still wants to be legalistic, you're going to say, you're just giving people a license to sin. Not nearly as bad as that Luke 15 story did. I mean, you want to talk about giving people a license to sin. Luke 15 gives people a license to sin because it shows you you can go out and waste everything and he'll still take you back. Yep. Just make me want, shut up. Come here and let me kiss you. I think we've done a fair job naming the age. We're going we're gonna to learn more about that. We've got a ways to go, but we've done a fair job naming the age. I think we've done a fair job of naming the land. I think he's bringing personal identification tonight to the ones that are designed to bring the land and the age into the fullness of its pre-designed intention. And could we miss some of what's available in a new age and a new land if we don't surrender to this identification? He delights in you.
He delights in you. Your name is not failure. And when you're doing well, he delights in you. Your name is just, he delights in you. What, what, what measure of beloved identity is that? I think we've seen the love of God in, through a religious lens as tolerance. Yeah, he loves us. He's got to. He has to. It's who he is. Praise God. He delights in you. I don't care what you're covered with tonight. He delights in you. Is, is, this is the antithesis of what we're supposed to be doing in revival. Right? We're supposed to be getting you to understand that you're filthy. Like you didn't know that. Like the boy didn't know he was covered, what he was covered in. The surprise of the story is not the boy figured out what he's covered in. The prize, surprise of the story is the father kissed him anyway. So maybe revival is not people getting the revelation of how filthy they are. It's people getting the revelation that regardless of how filthy you are, the father will kiss you anyway. And that kiss is the cure for years of wandering. How did he know he wasn't going to do it again? He kissed him so significantly. He so delighted in showing him mercy. Why would you ever want to leave the presence of that again? I don't feel like I'm supposed to have a call tonight. I don't feel like I'm supposed to receive an offering tonight. I don't feel, I, I feel like y'all, I, mean, I know we're going to leave without receiving an offering. I don't really care. I just, I feel like this family got together. Now, I feel like there's some people, this is probably a third of the crowd we've normally had in here in other revival meetings. I think the Lord, I think the Lord just said, I'm going to bring a specific group together for this specific night because I need to rename some people. Think of all the things you've been prophesied that you're going to be and do. None of it is legal if you don't first believe he delights in you. This makes me want to pray. Makes me want to sing. Makes me want to sit at his feet, Paige. Like, like if we could hit reboot on where we started tonight and people are antsy and itching to get on to the next thing, and Paige is up there crying, saying, one more minute, just one more minute. That's somebody who knows something about how he sees her that he's trying to teach all of us because it's going to give us grace to endure at his feet. He delights in you. Some tears come and just let that happen because you've judged yourself for your immature sincerity. Religion said if it's not full grown, it's not real. And I'm here to tell you, even the seed is real. It'll grow, but it won't grow because you aim at growth. It'll grow because you get in an environment where it has no choice but to prosper. Thank you, Father. Yes, Hephzibah. Hephzibah. Thank you, Lord. This feels more right in my spirit than I can even communicate. Yes, this is unlike any of these. I mean, normally we're bouncing off the walls by now. God's moving in the fear of the Lord and people shaking and crawling to the altar. But this feels right. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Hear the Lord say, many have come to me lately and said, Lord, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? He said, I've come to answer you tonight. 
Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? I want to be the real me. I want to be the authentic version of myself. And the Lord said, you are one who has the seed of sincerity in you. And I take delight in you. I am showing mercy in those areas of your heart and of your life where you can't seem to measure up. There are great measures of mercy there. So Hephzibah is your name. Hephzibah is your name. You're moving into a new age and you're moving into a new land and it will require you to be re-identified. Beloved identity is coming to you in a fresh measure tonight, says the Lord. That beloved identity is identifying you as Hephzibah and you and I are about to have some delightful times together. My light is is in my delight and I'm going to begin to cause illumination to come out of my people as they accept that my delight has been turned toward them. So I see a new light coming to you. I see a new glory streaming from you and you'll say the light came from his delight. The illumination came from his delight. What is his delight doing? It's igniting a new fire of passion on the inside of you to be alone with the one who finds delight in you. How do I produce a light? How do I become a light? The Lord said, you accept my delight. And that delight becomes your radiance. The radiant dawn of a new day where you become the manifestation of one who has embraced that he takes delight in me. You'll not aim at being luminous. You'll not effort to stream forth. As you accept that I take delight in you, I'm going to begin to cause a new fire, a new flame, a fresh ignition. I heard the Lord say to begin to come out of you because it's in you and it's going to begin to shine through you. You're a luminary. I heard the Lord saying that tonight. You are a luminary. You are a source of of light to a world shrouded in darkness because you've dared to believe even in my immature sincerity you take delight in me that interaction that interaction that you've been avoiding you're going to receive grace to embrace tonight that time alone that seems laborious is going to become a place of illumination in you as delight becomes the light, as the delight becomes the light, the delight becomes the light as you begin to say yes to him interacting with you the way that he sees you is you are as he sees you, not as you see yourself. So receive that re-identification tonight. Hefzibah, Hefzibah, Hefzibah. When you lay in your bed tonight, Hefzibah. When you rise early in the morning, Hefzibah. You're going to get seated in that identity. Seated in that identity. Never heard this taught and never heard that taught any day in my life. I've never heard Hefzibah taught one time ever in my life. The only time I'd ever even remember the word is when Mike Bickle was describing that dream. And at the, in the season of my life I was in when I heard that, I didn't even know how to hear that. But I can hear it tonight. It's only about that big in me, but I can hear it tonight. And I'm telling you, it feels like the gate to a world of mystery and intimacy, grace and interaction with the Lord. Feel that right there. What if, what if nations stream to you and kings stream to you and the wealth of the wicked is handed over to the righteous and streams begin to flow in the desert and people say, how'd, y'all do, how'd you do that? And you say, well, I dared to believe that he took delight in me. That's, no, that's not what I meant. I mean, strategically, what did you? No, I dared to believe he took delight. And he started dreaming through me. We entered into a mutual exchange of delight And it caused the desires of my heart to begin to be fulfilled. May you receive grace to move into a mutual exchange of delight. Delight yourself in the Lord. He give you the desires of your heart. Your name is Hephzibah. Thank you, Lord. 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 You feel that the seed of the real thing is in you. Somebody's got to come out of agreement with a lie. The seed of the real thing is in you. I don't care if it's just a seed. I don't need 20 years of fruit 
to prove what you are is sincere. The seed is sincere. The seed is sincere. When I was 13 years old and I couldn't get it together, I came into agreement with a lie that I would never measure up. And the lie that I would never measure up made me stray from the presence of Almighty God. It did. And I cycled back and forth based on how well I was doing. I did. I cycled back based on how well I was doing. And you know what I believed? I believed what was in me wasn't real. And nobody ever identified that what was in me was, it was sincerity in seed form. Why? Because I always wanted to get it right. God, if I could have dared to believe he delighted in showing mercy, maybe I'd have kept coming to his kisses even in the middle of my filth. <laughs> kept coming to his kisses even in the middle of my filth. Come on, don't, don't let shame produce a performance orientation in you. Don't do it. There's some people get in touch right now as we linger. I know it seems like we're just talking, but I'm telling you, what is in you is real, even if it's in seed form. What's in you is real. Even if it's in seed form. Hey, man, what is in you is real, even if it's in seed form. What's in you is real, even if it's in seed form. You don't have to have 20 years of faithfulness to prove what's in you is real. What's in you is real, even if it's in seed form. As some of you begin to weep right now, I feel like the Lord said that is healing some parts of you that have been in agreement with a lie. I thought we were closing, but we'll do, we'll do whatever the Lord says to do. You've come into agreement with a lie, and you always said, I need you to break covenant. I need you to divorce yourself from that lie, and you begin to dare to receive my identification concerning you. you your name is sincere. Your name is sincere. He identifies you as one who is sincere. You're in here tonight. That means something in you wants what's in you to be right. And Yahweh said, I don't wait until you can prove that. And I don't wait until you can measure up. My kisses come to you in the midst of your desire to come back home. Even if you've wandered away and you're covered in filth, if something in you wants to come back home, I'll kiss you right back into a place of authority. I'll kiss you right back into a place of belonging. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I believe at some point that son in that pig pen said, I may be, I may have ruined everything. One thing I have of value is I'm still his son. There's but one thing I have of value, and that's that one day he called me son. And although I may have completely blown it, I don't believe anything's changed about who he is. You know what that son found out? Not only was he right, but dad was better than he thought he was. That's the moral of that story. He's better than I even thought he was. You know what I think this will do? I think this will produce a real holiness movement. That's what I think will happen. You'll have people walking in real holiness. Instead of, instead of trying to manufacture and pretend, they'll actually be walking in holiness. You say, how did you get there? Well, I believed he delighted in showing mercy. He found delight in me. He changed my name. It's finishing an exchange. That's what it's doing, Harvey. It's finishing an exchange. Hephzibah. You feel that? Hephzibah. Wow, man. Hephzibah. I wish when I was this age right here, somebody told me that what was in me was real, even if it was immature, it's sincere, son. Even when your thinking tries to steer you off course, you'd never come into agreement with a lie that you're broken. No, you're, you're just having an encounter that's giving you permission to believe sincerity is growing in you, man. Feel that. Oh, man. Let me say, let me make this statement. This is kind of a little bit of a, a hermeneutical deal, but let me, let me make this statement to you. He delights in showing mercy that is new every morning. He delights 
in showing mercy that is new every morning that endures forever. He delights in showing mercy that is new every morning and that endures forever. Mercy is not something he gives because you can't seem to get it together. Mercy is his identity and Hephzibah is yours. Don't make mercy something God holds in his hand. It's his nature. This is producing a renewal. Some brittle, cracked thing. I don't know how we got back around to renewal. There's some gr- brittle, cracked places that are not going to be able to hold the next measure of wine. And he says, I'm going to come deal with this thought process in you. I'm fixing to pour something into you. And you're not going to be able to tell people you earned it. Not this one. Not what's coming. You're not going to be able to tell people you consecrated your way into this. So tired of that pretend nonsense. Hefzibah. There's stuff coming on the other side of that identification. He calls him Hephzibah, and he says, now watch what happens. If you can accept that name, and I'm telling you, many are not going to accept that name. The religious spirit will not accept that name. They'll accept sinners saved by grace, but they will not accept that he takes delight in them. Not, him taking delight in them is not part of their life. It is now their identity. He just got up every day and watched the road. Not that I'm going to whip his butt. If he ever gets back here, I'm going to, no. Oh, God, he just, I dream of a kiss on his face. Oh, I can't wait to cover him. I'm going to kiss him until it gets awkward. I'm going to kiss him until he can't stand it. I'm going to kiss him, and I'm going to kiss him, and I'm going to kiss him, and I don't care what he smells like, and I don't care what he looks like. If he ever starts back down that road, I am planning on planting some kisses on him that are going to plant him once and for all in Abba's house. Amen. Amen. You got something? You guys feel something to add to this? You probably have a novel you would like to add to this. Hephzibah. You feel something? Hephzibah. Hephzibah. Hep- not divorced. Just Hephzibah. Not addicted. Just Hephzibah. Not perverted. Just Hephzibah. Just Hephzibah is your name. Thank you, Lord. Like one of the greatest gifts... I could give you tonight, if I was going to give you a gift, is the understanding of he sees your struggle as immature sincerity, not failure. Isn't that good? If that's all it is, is my maturity needs to, my, my, my sense. Then let, me say, let, me, let me say something about this. For immature sincerity to become mature sincerity, you'll first have to identify that it actually is sincerity. Because one of the things that hampers that sincerity from growing up is you never feed it with the truth of what it is. And if you call immature sincerity hypocrisy, you'll never give immature sincerity the nourishment it needs to grow up. I want you to nourish that what's in you is actually sincerity. It might be that big, but it's sincerity. Amen. Tomorrow night, 6.30. Can we put some music on? I don't want those guys to have to play. You got you back there, Taylor. Just put something on that we can just soak a little while. Perfect. Have supper. Can't wait for the local tattoo shop to say, Why? Did 40 people show up to get Hephzibah? (laughs) Some some of you thought about it already. Hephzibah. Hephzibah.
feel like I feel like Yahweh showed me it's, it's thousands of people trapped in homosexuality are going to get set free because instead of them believing that their name is gay or lesbian or transgender, they're going to say, my name is he delights himself in me. And that's going to fix every other point of misidentification. But first, I'm going to have to dare to believe that my name is he delights in me. He wants to cover me with kisses instead of point out how sinful I am. He wants to cover me with kisses. This is gonna, we're going to change the way this thing works, man. A bunch of denominational people that grew up in charismatic, Pentecostal, impoverished theology are going to start to be used to show the world who God really is. You know what? We're going to thank God for everything we believed about him that was wrong because it's making us this more, much more passionate to believe the real thing about who he is. I changed something in my prayer life the last quarter of 2019. And it is that I called in my prayer life, I, call, I never called him Yahweh. I don't call him Yahweh anymore. Only Abba. Which has turned into Papa. Only Abba. 106 times in the Gospel of John, John says Jesus refers to him as Father. Jesus refers to God as Father 106 times in the Gospel of John. About 20 to 25% of the time, he refers to him as my Father. The first thing he ever says about him, the first words we ever hear out of Jesus' mouth, did you not know? I must be about my Father's business. Our Father who art in heaven, this is what he's doing. He says, I'm telling you, when I begin to bring the Abba revelation to me, do you know what it equaled? Hephzibah. He said, oh, if you get that about me, it'll be time for me to start talking to you about the next phase of who you are. I delight in you. Man, I'd trade that for you're powerful, you have authority, you have a gift, you're apostolic, you're prophetic, you're evangelist. Hephzibah. Hephzibah. For those of you that have hated your name, your name is Hephzibah. For those of you that have hated where your name came from, your name is Hephzibah. Feel that. For those of you that have despised how you were misidentified, you're now being re-identified, and Hephzibah is your name. Hephzibah is our name. Thank you, Lord. We're just going to let this music play. Do you to soak, flow, sparkle and flow. Thank you, Lord. I honor every seed of immature sincerity in this room tonight, and I identify that as sincerity in me, in you, in us.